So uh, this Sunday, as we are in our, the book of Acts, we're in chapter 9 today. And as we continue the study of chapter 9, we're going to continue to see how the gospel expanded from Jerusalem and then Judea, Samaria. We saw that last week, right? Uh, and, and then over the next few months, we'll see it go all the way to Rome. Um, and we're doing a two-week series that we started last week called Unexpected Missionaries. Last week in Acts chapter 8, we, thought we saw three kinds of unexpected missionaries, right? Anybody remember what the first group was? People who are running for their lives, right? Refugees. Uh, they, it was a great persecution, and it says all except the apostles were scattered. And then a few verses later, but those who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. How cool is that? So refugees. The second group was uh, people who are outsiders. Philip and then later Peter and James or John uh, went to Samaria. They're good Jews. You don't go to Samaria if you're a good Jew. They did. And they crossed those barriers. Uh, and then finally we saw cross-cultural mission, mission work uh, as Philip, a Hellenized Jew, so in other words a, a Hebrew with Greek upbringing, met an Ethiopian eunuch. Philip is unimportant, not famous, not wealthy. The eunuch is famous, wealthy, well-educated, but the gospel brought it together. So those are all unexpected missionaries. Today, I think we're going to see the most unexpected missionary of all in the book of Acts in chapter 9. That'll be our focus today. Um, for now, um, we're not able to speak or sing other than me, but I'll ask you in your heart and mind to speak the words. Uh, there's a couple questions for meditation after the sermon, so I'll ask you to stand as you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of the church, you took a man who is attacking your church and turned him into a missionary. Give us faith to see you at work, even in the most difficult of situations, and continue to raise up missionaries around the world to share the gospel. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Bible reading today, and we have only one because it's somewhat long, is from Acts chapter 9. And we're going to hear the first 19 verses. I would encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to read the entire chapter or the rest of the chapter when you get home today. And there is a reading schedule I'm sure that you've seen for the book of Acts. If you haven't seen it, look on our webpage. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. 
In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That's also our sermon text for today, and we're going to just jump right into it. As we look at unexpected missionaries, I told you how we saw three types of unexpected missionaries last week. Oh, can I get one of the ushers to turn off the front three lights? Or they're not listening. Michael, could you go over there? And Michael Babichek, could you go turn off the three switches by the black piece of tape? Thank you. Perfect. So we saw unexpected missionaries last week, and today we're going to see the most unexpected missionary of them all. Uh, it's shocking. And the only reason we're not shocked is because we've heard the account. We live 2,000 years later, and we all are familiar with it. But hopefully as we go through the text today, you will be at least a little bit shocked, at least a little bit surprised. And the reason I want you to feel that is because that will help us then to look at ourselves and say, well, if Jesus could do that with that guy, what could he do with me? So I want to begin with a house. All these images are courtesy of insider.com. They wrote an article about uh, one of those home renovation shows. You'll know which one it is in just a minute. But I wanted to share some before and after pictures. So this is before. I'm not sure if you're able to see it or not, even though we've got some lights off. It's fairly small. It's one of the good reasons to sit up front, right? You can see the pictures. And maybe the most obvious thing I can show you is to look at the front. There's two pieces of plywood laying on the ground next to the steps. You'll note the weeds growing in front of the very first step to go into the house. I looked at the picture, of course, on my computer screen a little more closely. The steps aren't in the best of shape. And if you look at the paint on the house, it used to be white. Now it's kind of dirty and there's something hanging down there from one of the corners of the roof. Um, the side, you can look at the siding on the side and it doesn't look very good. And now look at the after picture. Big difference, isn't there? Nice handrail on the steps, concrete step, uh, pad leading up to the steps, beautiful paint job, new roof. It's a beautiful house. And I, I wish I had written this down. I just didn't think of it when I was looking at the pictures this week. But this first picture, I believe the, per the family who bought this bought it for $28,000. I, I believe, oops, I believe that when, oh, sorry. Oh, that was stupid. Um, let's see here. Here we are. So I believe that when they bought this house, it was uh, $28,000. And then I think they sold it in this shape a number of years later for over a million. That's a pretty good investment, isn't it? And I'd like to find some of that. <laughs> So let me show you a few more pictures. Now it's top old, bottom new. So you see the yellowed walls, uh, the condition of the floor on top. On the bottom, you see there's a nice kind of a kitchen area there. I think that's what that is. Uh, maybe a bar and then a beautiful living room. Again, in the next photo, look at the condition of the floor there, junk on the floor. Look by the door. There's some staining there. And underneath, you've got a beautiful place to sit and talk with friends or family. Again, on top, you can see uh, the siding, there's some kind of siding on the inside of that house there. Um, and on the below, you see they put some stairs in right outside the door of the bedroom. So you can walk upstairs now to that, that uh, part of the house that's up top. 
And this is how they did that. You might recognize those faces. Um, I'm, I'm not, this is not my bag. This is not my thing. Gardening and home improvement, no. I don't do that. You want a Bible study in your house? I'm the guy. You want some, some work done on your house? You know, call somebody else in the church because I am not your guy for that. But these people know what they're doing. And uh, I've seen their show a couple of times when I've been traveling like in a hotel and they have the HGTV, so I'll turn that channel or, or, or someone will turn the, that channel and, and I have to watch it, right? Um, but uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines are pretty known for the work they do. Uh, he's kind of the builder. She's kind of the decorator. But they're both creative geniuses. The few times I have watched the show, it's actually pretty good. But they both have all kinds of creative ideas. And they work together. And then they have all these people they know that help them. And they can take an old crummy dump, a house that really should be condemned maybe, or could have been condemned, and they make it beautiful like we see in the pictures. But it takes a, it takes a, a creative genius to really kind of do that sort of, of a thing. Now, I want you to remember that as we go to the next before and after story here. We're going to look at the, uh, the Pharisee, Saul. This is him before. He's like an old house, peeling paint, black mold in the basement on the walls. Electrical circuits are bad. You might electrocute yourself if you touch one of them. So what is he doing with his life? Well, when Stephen or Stephen was killed at the end of chapter 7, we're told that the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. You know, it's hard work killing someone by throwing rocks at him. Would you hold our coats? And that's what Saul did. He took their outer garments and he watched over them, made sure that no one stole their phones or their wallets. Right? This is Saul. He's not a good guy. This is what he does. Look at the next verse. Saul was there giving approval to his death. You're doing the right thing. I applaud you. Nicely done. We need to get rid of these crazy followers of Jesus, Yeshua as the Messiah. They're wrong. No man could be God. I approve of the killing of this man. And it gets even worse. As we get into chapter 9 then, part of our text today, it begins by saying Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And I, and I looked up that Greek word, and it literally does mean like breathing out. In other words, when he's talking, threats are coming out. And he wasn't wearing a mask, was he? He was trying to destroy these people. He was trying to destroy the church. This is not a good man. And later on, this little section of verses, verses 1 and 2, we're told that he went to the high priest, and he asked him for paperwork. Do you remember who the high priest is? Caiaphas. This is the guy who got Jesus railroaded and crucified. This is the guy who questioned Jesus at the illegal trial on the Thursday we call Monday Thursday on that night. They weren't supposed to have trials at night. And when he point blank asked Jesus, are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus said, yes, just like you said it. He tore his clothes and he asked all his buddies, what do you think? And they said he's deserving of death. And so Caiaphas led the charge to go to the Roman governor's palace to have Pontius Pilate condemn him to crucifixion. That's the high priest. And we don't often think of Saul being in cahoots with the high priest Caiaphas. Right now, at this point, that's two evil men. You see, we know Saul in the later version that we all love. But he wasn't there yet at this time. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, as he writes to both Timothy and, and the people Timothy is caring for as their pastor, uh, he says, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. That's how Paul describes himself before he was Paul. A blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. He caused the death of both men and women. Not a good guy. Today we might call him a terrorist. He doesn't care if they're men or women. Anybody who belongs to the way. That's how the early Christians described themselves. They were followers of the way. The term Christian came up later, and I'll talk about that in a minute or two. But remember what Jesus says in John chapter 14. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the, the first Christians were people who followed Jesus, who is the way. He's the only way to the Father. And Saul said, I'm going to arrest him. I'm going to try and get him killed. So that's the before picture. Mold, bad electrical, spongy floors, dry rot, 
leaky roof, house that should be condemned. That's all. What about the after? The Apostle Paul, as he went by now, after some time, was used by the Lord to write 13 New Testament letters. Maybe 14. Some people think he may have written uh, the letter to the Hebrews. It's not signed. We don't know who wrote it. It's quite a different style, so I think it's probably someone else, but it might have been Paul. So 13, maybe 14 books of the New Testament. That's incredible. The Apostle Paul was the greatest missionary after Jesus uh, in the entire ancient church. Nobody was like him in terms of focus and mission and desire to have people know Christ as Savior. And I suspect his big turnaround had a lot to do with that. The Apostle Paul was used by the Lord to plant many churches and to bear witness, even in Rome. Isn't that incredible? Here's a guy trying to destroy the church, and, and later he tries to build it up. Here's one who attacks the church, and, and he becomes an apostle. Here comes one who, who's persecuting the church, and now he's trying to promote it like nobody else. How do you get from before to after? How do you take a, a beat-up old dump and turn it into a beautiful home to live in? you got to have creative genius, and in this case, you got to have Jesus. He's the only one who can do this. There's nobody else in the world, in the universe, who can take people like us and fix us. What does the Bible say? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all under condemnation. Have you ever been uh, in, in an old neighborhood? Or maybe you've been out maybe hiking, and, and you see a house and, and somebody from the county put a sticker on it. It says condemned. That's what God's word does to us on our own without Christ. All have sinned. Surely I was sinful from birth, says Psalm 51. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You could just slap that sticker right on me right here. Condemned. Without Christ. But with Christ, there's hope for a turnaround. And that's how Jesus turned around. Let's uh, turn around with Saul. Let's see how he did it. Acts 9, verses 3 to 6. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Those words are very, very comforting, aren't they? Twice Jesus says, you're persecuting me. Now, we're doing a bit of a switch this week. We've been pre-recording and posting on YouTube our worship services. Now we are pre-recording and posting on YouTube our Bible studies. So I encourage you to watch that each week. Uh, I, put them, I make them go live usually Saturday at 6 p.m. So I go into much more depth on this whole chapter, including the stuff we're not looking at today. But, but one of the interesting things that, that I focus on in that Bible study, I want to share with you as well today, is the fact that Jesus is the head of his body, which is the church. Now, if you go home today and drop a brick on your foot, is the rest of your body going to notice? Unless you have a nerve issue, yeah, it's going to notice, especially if you're wearing sandals. And so when the church is attacked, Jesus notices he's the head of his body, the church. And so when the followers of the way were being persecuted by Saul, Jesus noticed and Saul was going to Damascus to do more, some more persecuting, and Jesus went, whack! And he knocked him on his camp. Put him down in the road. Said, what are you doing? Stop persecuting me. And so if you ever experience persecution, when you feel that nasty comment from a relative on Facebook, when someone you tried to witness to in your neighborhood says, I don't need that Jesus stuff. Get that out of here. Jesus notices. It matters to Jesus. He cares about you. Jesus is so closely connected to his church that he notices any time anyone, any member of his body is persecuted. And that makes me feel hope for people in different countries where they are thrown into jail, like the New Testament Christians experience, where they do lose homes. They're separated from loved ones, and some of them are even put to death simply for following the way. So Jesus knocked him down. And did you notice that he was blind? 
I don't think that's an accident, right? Does Jesus do stuff by accident, by mistake? No way. And so we read in the text that he was blind. They had to lead him by the hand into Damascus. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, Paul, you think you got it all figured out? You're blind. Later on in one of his epistles, and again, this is in today's Bible study, Saul then Paul talks about who he was, and there's people bragging about their heritage. He says, well, if people want to brag, I could do that too. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrew. I studied under this famous rabbi Gamaliel. As to the law I, and keeping the, the Torah, I was faultless. And so, and so Saul is keeping very high company. Caiaphas, right? Remember that? He's keeping very high company as a Pharisee. He thinks he understands God. He actually thinks he's doing God's will. And Jesus knocks him down on the road and makes him blind and says, you don't know nothing. And don't think it was a mistake either that for three days he was blind. One day for every day Jesus was in the tomb. Let me help you think about this, Saul. One, two, three. Long, slow days of repentance and sorrow over his failures and his mistakes. That's the before picture. And then Jesus starts doing the after work. He's doing, he's doing the hard cleaning of repentance. And we all need that. I hope every one of you in this room have experienced that or will at some point. Because you can't be a Christian and be hard-hearted. You can't be a Christian and say, I don't care what God says. I've really done nothing wrong. I'm a good person. Christians don't say that. Christians recognize that we are broken sinners, redeemed, yes, and potential to do great things for God and, and healed partially before the day of the resurrection. Yes, that's all true. But it's also true that we are sinners in need of hearing the law of God so that the gospel can do its healing work. We need to recognize that we are, like Saul, the worst of sinners so that we're ready then to receive the gospel, the grace of God in Christ. And that's what Saul experienced. So Ananias went to the house. Do you love how Ananias showed a little bit of fear there? See, these aren't made up stories in the Bible. Jesus comes. I mean, if Jesus came to you and said, would you go talk to this guy, would you say no? Ananias did. He goes, wait a minute. I've heard about that guy. He's like the Darth Vader of the ancient world. I'm not going there. And Jesus says, just go. And so he did. Placing his hands on Saul. Can you believe that? Placed his hands on him? Do you recall how Jesus placed his hands on a leper before he healed him? Ananias placed his hands on Saul. Terrorist Saul, now becoming former terrorist. Violent man, cruel, heartless to families. And Ananias put his hands on him. Showed a gesture of kindness. And he said, brother Saul. Brother. Huh, really? Brother? This reminds me of what Jesus said when he rose from the dead. And as the women met him at the tomb, he said, go and tell my brothers. Remember those loser disciples? Go and tell my brothers to meet me in Galilee. Same thing here. Saul is no longer an enemy. Jesus has worked on him. And now he's becoming a brother to all the people in the church. And he's a brother already to Ananias. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Ananias makes two promises, right? I'm going to do, or God's going to do two things. You're going to see again, and you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So let's look at the gift list that Jesus gave to Saul. Number one, he gave him back his physical sight, but he gave him spiritual sight. You're not blind anymore. You've seen me. And Ananias has come to you, and he's giving you spiritual sight. I'm sure they conversed at length. Ananias, I'm sure, taught him some of the basics. What else did Saul receive? Then he received the Holy Spirit. Remember, Ananias said, you're getting two things here. You're going to see, and you're going to get the Holy Spirit. Well, what happened? Something like scales fell from his eyes, and then what happened? He was baptized. He was baptized. And you'll recall that Peter says in Acts chapter 2 to the people he preached to, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and, and for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
What else did Paul get? Saul. When, so, when the, the Lord had been talking to Ananias and Ananias objected, he said, go, this man is my chosen instrument. Chosen. To carry my name. So what did Saul get? Saul got a new calling for his life. Your job is not to destroy the church. Your job is to be part of the church. In fact, I'm going to make you a messenger, a missionary, an apostle. I have chosen you to do this. And then finally, Saul got a new name and a new identity. Now, we don't see that so much right away in Acts chapter 9. But we'll see it later on as we go through. And then, of course, all the letters that, that Paul writes, he never says Saul the apostle, does he? He always says Paul. He says, I'm a new man, I got a new name, and I got a new identity. I'm not a persecutor, I'm an apostle. I'm not an antagonist, I'm a messenger. Because the genius builder got a hold of him by the name of Jesus. Okay, so what about us? You can see what's coming, can't you? We're in the same place. I said before that, that we have sinned. We're, we're like a condemned building without Christ. But with Christ, we have all the same things that Saul received. We get spiritual sight. Did you know the Bible says that without Jesus, you're spiritually blind? You're not just neutral. It's not like, well, I could choose to be a Christian or I could choose not to be a Christian. Uh-uh. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, now that's Satan, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. If you're an unbeliever, you cannot by your own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ your Lord. It's impossible. You're blind. It's like taking a blind person, putting them in a car, saying, once you go out of the church parking lot, turn right after about 70 feet, Go up Coach Lane, wait for the light to turn green, turn left, merge over to the right side, go on the little turn and get on the Highway 50 and drive down to Sacramento. That's all. It's impossible for a blind person to do that. We get frightened enough when we're teaching our children to drive, don't we? Can you imagine being in the car with a blind person? Stop! And so the Bible teaches you and me that without Jesus... We're spiritually blind. But what happened? Verse 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. You are brought to faith. You are given faith. You are given light. You're given sight. It's just as if you were blind and couldn't see. And Jesus comes along by the power of the Spirit and allows you to believe in him. That's why you believe. Jesus made it happen. And it's the Holy Spirit who does it. Just like Saul received the Holy Spirit at baptism, so did you. Titus 3. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Lord, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal. Well, that's obviously a reference to baptism. But I love what it says next. He did that by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously. Now, we've got hand sanitizer, one in the narthex, one in the hallway, or somewhere out there. And if you've made hospital visits, they're on all the walls and outside most of the rooms. If you've gone to a nursing home, same thing, right? Uh, and, and so we're used to doing that now. And the best ones, right, are the electronic ones. You don't have to push a button or a lever because somebody else pushed that. And so you just put your hand under there. But have you ever noticed there's some that don't work quite right? And you put your hand under there, it goes, Burp. and you get like a little teeny drop. It's like, ooh, what will I do with all that sanitizer? I don't know. And you have to go, boop, 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 like three or four times. And then you finally have enough to sanitize your hands. I think sometimes we, we look at God that way and maybe you don't feel very strong in your faith or you've given into temptation and you go, man, I wish I had more Holy Spirit. I think when I was baptized, God just went, boop, gave me a little drop, a, a little mist, a little, 
a little particle of a mist or a little tiny droplet from a, a spray. No. He poured out his spirit on us generously. Almost too much. And you were sanitized, your body, mind, soul, and spirit, in your baptism, completely made righteous in God's eyes. He saved you by that washing of rebirth and renewal. Made you a new person. And so you have the spirit. All that you need, the spirit has been given you. He lives in you. And that changes your identity too. Look at the bottom of that verse. We might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And that's what I want to talk about next. We have a new identity, new name and an identity. I went too fast. Okay, come on. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Right? If you're an heir, I mean, you must be part of the family, right? And that's what you are. You're no longer a condemned building, a condemned sinner. You've been made righteous because Jesus took your condemnation to the cross. Jesus took the sin of me and of you and bore it on the cross. Like, like a building that was condemned, Jesus met the bulldozer of God's wrath on the cross. Or like that swinging wrecking ball, the wrecking ball of God's wrath. That's what Jesus experienced. Boom! So you and I don't have to. And because that happened, that's not who you are anymore. You're not a condemned sinner. You're a child of God, a chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, people belonging to God. That's your identity. That's who you are. You're not a failure. You're not a loser. You're a new person. But you have more than just an identity. You have a purpose, a calling. Not to be an apostle like Saul or Paul, but to do what? It says it right here. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That you might be a witness. That's why. And so you have a new name and a new identity. And that makes for a different life. So if you suffer as a Christian, there's your name. Do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Did you know that the name Christian actually was derogatory when it was invented? In Roman culture, they would do what we do in our culture, and I think every culture does. If there's a new group that pops up, especially if it's unpopular, people give it, oh, those people, whatever it might be. And so uh, maybe, the, maybe the best example I can give to you, when I was in high school, a long time ago, nerds, believe it or not, were not cool. Nerds were nerds. Nerds, when I was going to high school, nerds were like, yeah, you don't want to be a nerd. Nerds got made fun of. What are nerds now? I think they own everything, don't they? Right? <laughs> nerds rule the world. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they changed the world forever. Uh, I watched a documentary on PBS years ago, and I forget the title of it, but it was something like, you know, the nerds shall inherit the earth, or triumph of the nerds. I think it was triumph of the nerds. I think that's what it was called. Amazing what has changed. And now, if you call someone a nerd or a geek, they're like, yeah, thank you. Things have changed. And, and the term Christian originally was a derogatory term. Oh, those Christ followers, Christians. But now Peter says, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. That's who you are. You're a follower of the Christ. And that is awesome. Praise God that you bear that name. And you do. So God is your fixer-upper and mine. He takes his tools, his word and his sacraments, and he works on you and me. And he gives us everything that we've seen this morning. He gives us a new start. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us a new name and an identity and a calling. We're brand new people. And that gives us hope then for living in an old, tired world, a world filled with fear, Hatred, racism, medical scares. I don't know what's going to happen next month. Who knows? But I do know that Jesus will keep fixing us up until he takes us into eternity. And then everything will be as it should. Everything. And we get to be there. So this is a foretaste of the feast to come. I am so happy to be worshiping with you again. And I pray that soon we'll all be able to do this more and more and we'll be healthier so we can do word and sacrament together face-to-face -to -face, every time. In Jesus' name, amen.
One thing I want to continue doing as I was doing on the YouTube videos is to give you a minute or so and some questions for thought. So here you go. Please stand for the Apostles' Creed, as you are able. And we can turn the lights back on. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Jesus, you are the Lord of the church. You made a missionary out of Saul, an enemy of the church. Forgive us for thinking that we could not be neighborhood missionaries and lead us to share the gospel with the people we have contact with. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you created all things and they were very good. Our sin has spoiled your good creation, yet you continue to love us because of the Christ. We ask you in your mercy to bring healing to all those afflicted by disease and illness. Grant your strength and comfort to those near death and those who care for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Source of all wisdom, we pray for our county supervisors, for our governor, for our president, and for all public servants. Give them the wisdom to lead in a godly manner and protect and preserve them. During this turbulent time, work healthy reform where needed, bring safety to citizens who are in danger, and protect those who serve in law enforcement. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Father, you provide for the needs of the body through jobs and employment. We ask your providence and care for businesses and individuals in this land and around the world. Help economies here and in other nations to recover soon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, as we go to the Lord's Supper today, we ask you to prepare us through repentance and faith, to recognize your body and blood actually present with bread and wine. Lead us to receive with reverence and joy the forgiveness of our sins and the life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we pray the words you have given us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. 
This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> true body of Christ given for you. Take the body of Christ. This is the true body of Thank you. 
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace to life everlasting. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Just a couple of very brief announcements. I'll remind you again, if you're in that section or seating, you go out that hallway and out the doors. You guys go right down the middle like you came in. 
you folks go off to the side unless you want to wait to use hand sanitizer, and then uh, you, you can go down the middle. I, I neglected to mention before the service began, on the bathroom doors, and these are only bathrooms available on Sunday mornings, there are um, little uh, devices, little attachments that you put your foot on. So you can push your way in easy, right? Getting in is easy, but when you leave, if you don't want to touch the door handle, put your foot on top of the little piece of metal that sticks out from the bottom of the door. You can pull open enough to get your elbow in and then, and then open the door. We have everything here, don't we, right? Um, other couple of, of great announcements. First of all, doesn't the sanctuary look nice? You know, it's not a ways to go yet, but Brian Morris has been working hard along with a number of other friends that he has and other workers. We got uh, air conditioning units for the back building put up. Um, so we're just chipping away at that. You'll get more information next week. Next week, Brian Thaker, our treasurer, will also have a, a short video, probably a minute long, that will give a financial report. Um, and then uh, really exciting news, August 2nd, Pastor Kyle Weeks will be installed as our associate pastor. I am praying, and I ask you guys to pray that we can all get together and sing on that day. It's probably a bit of a long shot, but you never know. So I'm going to pray like mad. Uh, that'll be in the afternoon at 4 o'clock on Sunday, August 2nd. At the very minimum, we'll be able to have 60 people there, and maybe some next door watching on that TV or something. I don't know. But hopefully we can all be together. But in any case, that's the installation date, August 2. Uh, he is finishing up some summer classes over the next five weeks or so. I think that's it. Uh, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.